So let me welcome you all to this special session on regulatory developments that the Financial Stability Institute traditionally organizes in the context of the BIS General Annual General Meeting. This session returns after a two-year break during the pandemic, and I'm glad to chair to share it again. This, this year we have chosen a highly topical theme, climate-related financial risks, on which national and international regulatory organizations have already been working intensively for some time. I think by now there is broad consensus on the need for a determined and comprehensive policy response to foster a swift and orderly transition towards a low-carbon economy. Moreover, most agree that governments should take a leading role in uh, spearheading these efforts through a combination of policy instruments such as carbon taxes, subsidies and guarantees, governments can create a framework of incentives to foster innovation and steer consumers and, and corporates uh, towards their sustainability goals. That does not mean that central banks and supervisory authorities do not have a role to play. Quite the contrary, since the financial system allocates resources across the economy through its intermediation function, strategic decisions of financial firms can help determine whether the transition to sustainable economy succeeds or, or fails. Therefore, financial sector authorities should not stand in the way of funding for orderly transition. In fact, by, by ensuring that the financial system manages its exposure to, to climate-related financial risks, authorities will make a significant contribution to an orderly transition to a low-carbon economy. Similarly, uh, by promoting sound accounting and disclosure practices by market participants, regulators will foster a more effective allocation of resources and minimize the risk of greenwashing. In other words, in pursuing their mandates with clarity and determination, authorities support broader sustainability policy objectives. But of course, no change to authorities' objectives does not imply no change to their policies. Indeed, a key question is whether new regulation is needed to address the implications of climate-related financial risk for financial stability or market functioning. And the answer to this question is probably yes, for at least three, three reasons. First, most climate risk will materialize over medium and long time horizons. By contrast, the time horizons used in current regulation, for instance, to, to calibrate capital requirements, are relatively shorter, typically one year. Second, climate-related events and transition pathways are highly uncertain. In addition, the revolution will probably involve nonlinearities and tipping points. This means that the largely backward-looking traditional approach based on historical loss experience will probably fail to capture the forward-looking element, elements of these risks. And third, at this juncture, available taxonomies for climate-related exposures along with associated accounting and disclosure practices are still insufficiently developed and harmonized across sectors and jurisdictions. This suggests a, a strong case for enhancing and expanding the existing regulatory framework to ensure that the financial system properly manages and discloses climate exposures. However, in practice, authorities will need to overcome significant challenges to come up with meaningful adjustments to address climate risks. This includes the development of sound methodologies for forward-looking analysis and the collection of comparable, good quality, granular data that will improve the estimation of climate-related losses. So does this mean that authorities should wait until better tools and data are available? Well, I think the answer is a resounding no. The, the risks are there, even if we cannot calibrate them with sufficient uh, precision. We need, however, a, a gradual approach that could allow both regulators and firms to learn by doing, while at the same time taking precautionary action to mitigate the adverse implications of relevant climate scenarios. It is true, though, that the current situation does not favor such conservative policy approaches. In particular, the war in Ukraine has brought to the fore, to the fore concerns about energy security which may result in delays in implementing uh, existing commitments or even the reversal. However, if anything, this episode should prompt a rethinking of energy security policies to reduce dependency on fossil fuels that are only extracted in a few specific jurisdictions 
and increased reliance on re renewable uh, energy. In other words, over the medium term, at least, energy security and sustainability objectives do not conflict and may well uh, be complementary. In any, in any case, I think we'll agree that navigating this complex environment is not a small task. Unfortunately, while there is still much work uh, to be done, standard setting bodies uh, and international organizations have made significant progress over the last few years. In this panel today, we will discuss the journey that they have taken so far to address uh, the, the challenges posed by climate change and how they plan to make further progress with a view to ensuring the stability and effective functioning of the financial system. For that purpose, I am very happy to be joined by a superb lineup of speakers who are well placed, extremely well placed, I would say, to cover these important issues from different angles. So let me introduce them by alphabetical order. First, Jonathan Dixon, Secretary General of the International Association of Insurance uh, Supervisors. Dietrich Domanski, Secretary General of the Financial Stability Board. Neil Escho, Secretary General of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Thomas Wright, Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the International Sustainability Standards Board. Uh, Sabine Mauderer, Vice Chair of the Network for the Greening of the Financial System. Uh, and Martin uh, Mullini, Secretary General of the International Organization of Securities Commissions. Thank you all very, very much for accepting our invitation to share the important work your organizations have been carrying forward to address climate-related financial risks. So I will propose to organize the, the panel uh, as follows. First, I would like to ask uh, each of you to, to share the work that has been done so far and what remains to be done, so what your immediate plans for the forthcoming future. And in answering this question, I would be extremely grateful if you could let us know how concerns about energy security stemming from the war in, in Ukraine and the related policy trade-offs could affect the work priorities of your organizations. Then in a second round, I would like to, to delve into some specific actions your organizations um, have recently taken in this area. And then lastly, of course, I will open the floor for questions from the or comments, questions or comments or remarks from the from the uh, from the audience. So before going to my to my first question, allow me to highlight a few housekeeping rules. First, uh, this session has been recorded and it will be posted on the BIS uh, website in the next uh, few days. Uh, second, questions from participants are extremely welcome. So for those who are attending the meeting in person, you will have just to raise your hand, and one of uh, my colleagues uh, will hand you a microphone. Uh, for virtual participants, please use the chat uh, or, or the raise hand function in the WebEx uh, screen, and, and we will, of course, give you the floor. With that, let me, let me ask Jonathan uh, to, to, to share with us the important work IIS has done in this area, the plans for the future, and the extent to which concerns around energy security have affected uh, IIS's work uh, priorities or the work program. Uh, then I will go to Dietrich, to Neil, to Sue, Sabine, and, and Martin. So, Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us. You have the floor now. Um. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fernando. hope you can hear me all okay. And uh, a very big thank you for being part of this session and, and also to be able to talk about uh, a topic which is very key uh, to the IS and, and the IS's priorities. Um, I mean, perhaps I can start with the, f the last part of your question. Um, uh, and, and certainly we do, we do as part of our work, um, try and make sure we track short-term risks, including energy security uh, risks and what that means for the global insurance sector and help our insurance supervisors understand those risks and how to respond to them. Um, but I, I think what I uh, would like to focus in particular is that we remain very much committed to our longer-term goals around uh, supporting the response to, to climate change. Uh, so we, we uh, and let's say we, we haven't taken our foot off the accelerator, um, uh, particularly as the smooth transition scenario now looks increasingly unlikely uh, in, the, in the light of recent developments, uh, which will increase both transition and physical risks uh, for the insurance sector. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that we actually have a consensus uh, amongst our members 
uh, uh, consensus in international standard setting bodies is, is a rare thing. So I'm very happy that we, we have consensus on this topic, on, on the need for action uh, and the need to take action now, uh, uh, given the threats that climate change pose to the insurance sector. Uh, and we've, we've, we've put out some clear statements on that. So we've been putting, working on these issues for a number of years, um, perhaps uh, almost a, a little bit uh, early adopters amongst the standard setting bodies on this topic, probably because of the outsized impact of climate change on the insurance sector. And our work is on, focused on four fronts. I'll try to run through those quickly. Firstly is uh, risk assessment. Um, and it's, uh, you know, because it's essential if you're thinking about policy work to have a clear understanding of the risk to which the insurance sector is exposed. Um, and our risk assessment framework, which is our annual global monitoring exercise, uh, is key to this. The GME is, is based on data from about 60 of the world's largest insurers, uh, information from 30 uh, 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 jurisdictions, so it covers about 90% of the global insurance market and, and means we have a very good evidence base uh, for sort of an empirical discussion of, of, of risks. Um, and we share the outcomes of the GME uh, with the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, and we also publish it in our annual global insurance market report, which uh, I in, in, encourage those interested to have a look at. Um, last year, we published the first global analysis of the risks posed to the insurer's assets uh, from climate change in a special chapter of our GMAR. Um, and, and this provided a detailed analysis of the impact of different climate scenarios on insurer's solvency. Uh, happy to take questions on that. Um, but to, you, to your point, Fernando, data really is key. Um, and that's why we've added climate-related data elements to our global monitoring exercise collected from supervisors. Um, and this will become a regular feature of our GME going forward. We're also discussing uh, about how we go about collecting data directly from insurers. And we're discussing that with them at the moment to try and understand what data they already uh, collect, what do they use for their monitor own monitoring and, and and, and, and managing of these risks and to build that uh, into our GME. Uh, and then this will provide data-driven inputs into the FSB's broader climate risk assessment work through the SCAV. The second area is standard setting. Uh, and we regard climate risk as a, as a key driver of existing risks. Um, and therefore, we see the importance of integrating this into our international standards, in particular our insurance core principles, and we've undertaken a gap analysis on that, and happy to come back to that later. Thirdly is on supervisory practices, uh, where we're aiming to support our members to address practical challenges in responding to climate risk, in particular guidance on good supervisory practices. We, we published some initial fee uh, guidance already back in 2018, which we also fed into the NGFS's uh, supervisory handbook. We'll feed into FSB SRC's work as well. Um, and we've two, we have, uh, in terms of forward-looking, two new work streams, one in particular on climate risk scenario analysis, uh, which I can come back to. Uh, um, uh, and then fourthly, is on disclosure, uh, and at this stage, I guess we have what would describe as a watching brief uh, on any changes to insurance disclosure. We're very supportive of this work at the ISSB, and we'll be responding to the ISSB's exposure draft. Um, and once the details of the scope are a bit clearer, we'll also consider whether there's any insurance-specific additional disclosures that might be needed. But I do, th I think we are mindful that the ISB already includes sector-specific guidance, and therefore there'll be quite a high bar uh, for additional disclosures. And then uh, briefly, lastly, um, we've last week, in fact, our executive committee agreed to add a fifth area, which is really, you know, up until now, I think we've been looking at how do we manage climate risks to the insurance sector uh, Exco has agreed we need to be also doing work at how, how the insurance sector can help the transition to a, a low carbon uh, future uh, and what is the role of supervisors 
in, in, in supporting that transition, particularly around protection gap issues uh, and things like nat natural catastrophe protection gaps. So a lot on the go. Let me, let me stop there. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. I think uh, you left your intervention precisely a very hot point. I mean, uh, what is the role of regulation, basically, to facilitate mm. the transition and so on? I'm sure I will be able to cover that later in the in this session. So let me now give the floor to Dietrich, uh, who's going to comment on the FSB work on the matter. Dietrich, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Hmm? Thank you, Fernando. The FSB's climate-related work is, is guided by the FSB roadmap to address financial risks from climate change. And uh, this comprehensive roadmap was uh, developed in, uh, in 2021. It was endorsed um, by the G20 in July 21, so almost one, one year ago. The objective of the roadmap is to ensure that climate risks are properly reflected in all financial decisions going forward. And uh, in order to achieve that, the roadmap has four areas, uh, disclosures, data, vulnerabilities analysis, and policy, that is regulatory and supervisory approaches to deal with, with climate risk. Now, um, the roadmap was endorsed, as I said, a year, a year ago. Since then, uh, there has been intensive work um, um, uh, on, on all four areas, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from, uh, from Neil and uh, also from, from Martin on the disclosure side and uh, also from other colleagues. Um, so let me perhaps just comment on how um, recent developments have um, affected our thinking about the road. I think it's fair to say here, echoing what, uh, um, what Jonathan said, that if anything, there is now a sense that making progress on the roadmap um, is even more urgent uh, than it was before, because what uh, the war in Ukraine has shown is that um, financial risks related to climate change, not least transition risks, considering the intense debate about current and future energy policy, are not just a long-term issue, but they are a reality now and need to be addressed now. Um, so as I said, uh, in terms of the big picture work is addressing in, in all four areas of the roadmap and don't want to steal the thunder from colleagues on this panel, just to mention that we published a couple of weeks ago for publication an interim report on supervisory and regulatory approaches to addressing climate-related financial risks. The current focus of our work is on developing a framework for monitoring climate-related financial risks. Um, uh, a lot of support for this work, a lot of interest in it. Um, at the same time, very difficult, challenging, uh, not least uh, because of the data, data limitations that we are still facing in, in a number of, uh, of areas. Um, let me um, also mention perhaps more generally um, uh, how uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has, um, has affected our work program. And Fernando, you mentioned en energy security. I think energy security issues are part of um, a, a broader, profound change in the global economic and financial market backdrop. And um, um, uh, this, uh, I think, deterioration in the, in the growth outlook, um, the, the fact that inflation is back, that uh, global financial conditions are tightening um, is, is something that is, of course, related to the, uh, to the debate about climate policies and the importance of uh, the climate agenda. Now, one specific area that um, uh, I think we are all aware of that has become very important is commodity markets. And um, uh, we've, we've seen in March um, bouts of high market volatility, large commodity price swings. Um, it hasn't had this period of volatility, any, any major repercussions on the financial system at large. No financial, a major financial institution has shown signs of distress. However, there are a couple of things that um, are important with respect to the financial aspects of commodity markets, and um, we are currently looking into, into these issues. Um, one is, um, Considering that very volatile commodity prices may give rise to financial st strains, um, the role of margin calls here, uh, margin calls uh, in 
um, in, in, in organized markets, but also um, in, in over-the-counter markets. Um, the role of undetected leverage, I'll come back to that in a second, and um, concentrated uh, exposures. Again, these are core financial stability issues, but they also matter for um, the climate debate because by impairing the financing, the supply of key energy, base metal and food commodities, strains in commodity prices may have disproportionately large macro effects, which in turn may affect energy policies and um, uh, policy priorities. Um, just a work on, on undetected leverage. Um, here, I think we've seen uh, the recent LME nickel case, just to mention, um, that certain banks, particularly prime brokers, seem to be prepared to take large positions without sufficient visibility into the total leverage of, of their counterparties, quite similar to, to Archegos um, uh, some time ago. So this raises questions about transparency and risk management capacity of, of, of lenders, and, and such questions are important and somewhat discomforting in an environment of high debt levels in the non-financial sectors generally and uh, tightening financial conditions. So um, the bottom line, um, we are taking forward our, our climate agenda as defined, as laid out in the roadmap. Um, however, um, we need to be mindful that in the end everything hangs together and that current developments and preserving financial stability um, 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 against the backdrop of these developments is a precondition for being able to make progress on uh, climate issues. Let me stop here. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's worth obviously going to some relevant trade-offs that uh, have to be faced by, by policymakers in the current complex uh, juncture. And that affects, obviously, actually work on, on, on climate-related financial risks. Thank you for that, uh, Dietrich. So let me now give the floor to, to Neil to give us the DCBS uh, perspective on, on this important matter. Hmm? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Thank you for the invitation uh, to speak today. I should start by saying I agreed with everything you said. Uh, it could have been my own speaking remarks. So I may borrow them off, off you for a future future uh, presentation. Uh, there, you, you'll probably find a lot of commonality in what uh, in what we cover uh, in terms of the risk perspective, in terms of the data gaps. Uh, uh, it, you know, climate-related risk covers all all our all our sectors. So I think we're all we're all grappling with, uh, with the same challenges. Uh, in terms of the Basel Committee, uh, climate-related financial risk is obviously uh, a key element of the committee's work program. I expect uh, that to remain the case uh, uh, for the coming years. Uh, we very much do take uh, a risk perspective uh, to this issue. Uh, it is a risk that banks face. It is a risk that affects the broader financial system. Uh, so it's important that banks measure uh, and manage this risk uh, as they would do for uh, other uh, other more traditional risks. Uh, in terms of the work that the committee's done, uh, we started, uh, we created our task force on climate related financial risks back in uh, early 2020. Um, that group started off by, by doing some basic research to, to try and understand the risk features of climate change and the potential implications for individual banks and the broader banking system. Uh, so we wanted to start as much as possible. Uh, with a strong methodological basis uh, for the work. Um, we did publish two reports based on that work in April 2021. Uh, these reports looked at the risk drivers and their transmission channels of climate-related risk uh, and also me uh, measurement methodologies. Um, they're quite long reports, uh, but the, the, the summary of the conclusion uh, is basically that uh, uh, climate risk drivers can uh, translate into traditional risk categories. Uh, so you can take climate risk and think about how that translates into things like credit risk, market risk, operational risk. So the conclusion from that work was we didn't need to think of climate risk as a new and separate risk. Uh, we could use the existing Basel framework and, and, uh, and, and capture those risks uh, within that. Um, building off that work, uh, the committee is pursuing what we call a holistic approach, and I, and I mean that in the boss, best possible way. Uh, so a combination, you know, we have basically have three tools. It's regulation, supervision, disclosure. Uh, so we're doing work on all three fronts. Uh, we're doing work in parallel on all three fronts. Uh, and to some extent, uh, the final outcomes, what we come up with in the end, uh, will be a trade-off across uh, these, three, these three tools. 
Uh, let me say a little bit about, uh, about each of the, these areas. Uh, firstly, in terms of supervision, uh, last week we published uh, principles for the effective management and supervision of climate-related uh, financial risks. So these are kind of standard risk management principles that we've covered uh, in many other uh, risk areas. It covers governance, internal control, risk assessment, management reporting, scenario analysis, uh, etc. The, uh, the, the aim of the principles is to provide a common baseline for internationally active banks uh, and improve both their risk management and supervisory practices. They are principles, so they, are, they, they retain flexibility, and the idea is that this allows for uh, heterogeneity across jurisdictions and in practices. Um, on the disclosure side, uh, we're very supportive of the work of the ISSB, uh, so we're following that closely, uh, working together closely with the ISSB, FSB, etc. Uh, on disclosure. Um, but I think we'll also have to come up uh, with our own standards here in, in terms of the Pillar 3 framework, uh, but I think there's a lot of commonality there uh, and we'll definitely build off the work that, that others are doing. Um, finally, uh, on regulation, uh, I mentioned these two uh, analytical reports. Um, following that, the committee did a gap analysis, so we basically looked at the Basel framework uh, to identify uh, where climate-related financial risks may not be adequately addressed and, and to uh, then develop ways uh, of addressing uh, these risks. Um, I think the main outcome of that gap analysis, and I might get to this later, is that it highlighted a range of different challenges associated with uh, measuring and mitigating uh, climate-related financial risks, and Fernando uh, touched, on, uh, touched on a few of these. Uh, and the thing I would, I would emphasize at this point, uh, the challenges that apply to regulation, they equally apply to supervision and disclosure. Uh, so it's not as if you know, the challenges we're facing just apply to regulation. They, they apply to, to all areas of, uh, of policy making. Um, at this stage, I would, uh, I would say the committee, just to summarise, is working on developing the best combination of policy tools across regulation, supervision uh, and disclosure. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely working on trying to come up with what we think are the best, uh, on the regulation side, pillar one options, uh, but that doesn't presume either way uh, that we'll come up with a pillar one charge uh, or not. Um, in terms of the second part uh, of your question, uh, Fernando, uh, let me say a few words about uh, the impact of the war in, uh, in Ukraine on our work priorities. Um, at the committee level, the initial focus was very much on trying to understand banks' direct exposures um, uh, to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, for most jurisdictions and banks, uh, those exposures were small. Uh, in cases where the exposures were more material, uh, they, were, uh, they remained manageable uh, and contained. Oh, okay, sure. Should, should I start from the beginning? No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I assume that's a no. Okay. Um, so going back to uh, uh, the, the impact uh, on our work from, from the war in Ukraine, uh, as I said, we started off by looking at um, banks' direct exposures. The conclusion fairly quickly in most banks, in most jurisdictions, was that the exposures were small or manageable. Uh, we then focused um, our attention on banks' uh, potential indirect exposures, and these could come from a, from a range of different avenues. One is via uh, bank card, uh, counterparties, so that could be corporates, uh, MBFIs with, the, with direct exposures to Russia. It could come via affected markets, and, and Dietrich touched on, on commodity markets. Uh, it could come through the impact on the broad macro economy, and again, uh, Dietrich touched on that in terms of inflationary pressures and then the implications for rising rates. Uh, at the committee level, we've done a lot of work on uh, potential snapback risk, rising interest rates, and how that could play out uh, in terms of impacting uh, the banking system. Um, the last thing I'd say, there was a lot more focus on operational risk or operational resilience. Um, and essentially in two areas, uh, the first one being compliance with the sanctions. Everybody wanted to meet the sanctions, nobody wanted to uh, do the wrong thing, but for a large internationally active bank, it's quite, it's quite a complex exercise. So it was more about supervisors facilitating uh, banks meeting those, those requirements. And the other area of operational resilience that became more important for many supervisors was resilience to cyber attacks. Um, which uh, definitely did increase in number, uh, but again, um, I would say things remained uh, resilient. 
In terms of the impact on our work on climate-related risk, I would say uh, it didn't really change so much. There was no specific impact on the work. I think it obviously highlighted the importance of climate risk and also the, some of the complexities and the challenges associated with uh, transitioning uh, to net zero. And it probably focused people's minds uh, uh, more on transition plans. I'll stop there. Thank you. you can I use my own micro? Or? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> So thank you very much, Anil, very comprehensive over overview. Of course, part of your intervention was about Pillar 3, disclosures, transparency, and it's a very good introduction to the next speaker, who is uh, Sue Lloyd. She's the vice chair of the International Su Sustainable Standards Board, uh, newly created a board, which is pretty much looking at these very issues. So thank you very much for coming over. Mm. Thank you. And Kirsty, can you hear me so I don't have to do it twice? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. So thank you very much, Fernando. And so, yes, the newly established International Sustainability Standards Board. So I might start there first, actually, to explain what we're all about. So the newly established board was created or announced at COP26 last year. And really the purpose of the board is to set out uh, disclosure requirements about sustainability, uh, risks and opportunities to enable those providing finance to companies to understand the effects of those risks and exposures on the, on the values and the risks that they would be taking on by providing finance to those entities. And our objective is to have high quality, relevant, reliable data on these risks provided to the market and for it to establish what we call a global baseline so that investors around the world and banks around the world would have access to that comparable high quality information all around the world. And I'm working very closely actually with Martin to try to achieve that, that global dream. Um, so if I look then um, at what we've been doing since we were established, we put out at the end of March two draft standards. So our first two draft standards, which I'll um, talk mainly about our climate one, but there's two. And the first one is a general set of requirements asking for information to be provided on all of a company's significant sustainability-related risks and opportunities. So that's really important. It's not only climate that the board is looking at. But then we've got a second exposure draft, a set of proposals that focus specifically on climate information and the effect of climate risks and opportunities. And in that set of proposals, we ask for information about how companies are governing their climate risk, what their strategy is for climate risk, how they risk manage climate and information, metrics and targets on their current status, their plans going forward and how, they are, how well they're achieving their plans and targets. So, so that's what we set out in, in the document. And when we look at climate uh, risks, we're asking for information about the effects of physical risks on the company, so flood risk, etc., from the assets that they hold, but also transition risk. How might they need to change their business model going forward? How would that affect their future profitability, their ability to get funding? Um, so shedding light on the path looking forward in different scenarios. So I'm going to get to know you well too, I'd say. Um, so looking then at, the, at what that means for the banks providing our climate um, proposals, it would mean that from the, the, from the perspective of the bank's own reporting, we'd get a, a clearer picture, a more relevant, reliable, globally comparable picture of the risks that a, that a bank's exposed to from its lending decisions, um, which is obviously really important. We'd also get a picture of its transition path, its plans for transition planning in different climate scenarios, including how its lending might need to change given what's happening to its clients. So I think for the banks themselves, actually, they are both going to be required to apply the standards, but they're also going to be beneficiaries of the standards. Because when their customers are applying our climate document, they'll get a better picture of their customers' um, exposures to climate risk. So that will enable them to better understand the risks they're exposed to when they lend to those companies. And in the instances where the banks are choosed or perhaps require to make uh, lending decisions to facilitate uh, transition in the real economy, they'll be able to look at our ex, um, disclosures that require others to uh, set out their transition plans to help them make informed decisions on where they put their money if they want to consciously move the money to affect um, a, a, a change in, in transition uh, to green the system. So a really, I think, important set of disclosures to try to affect change. One of the specific sets of requirements that we're asking for disclosure 
from the banks on is their financed and facilitated emissions. So when they lend money, what are they facilitating in terms of scope one and two uh, emissions, for example? So our next steps, um, our documents are out for comment until the end of July. Uh, once the comments come back, we're going to try and finalise these proposals as soon as possible. Our objective, if all went well, would be to finish our discussions by the end of the year. The new board will be in place from July to enable us to discuss that in our um, public meetings. Um, and so then we'll move on to, um, to, to finalise those requirements. Then we've got a journey of getting adoption of our standards around the world. We want them to be adopted by others around the world to get this global set of information available um, for the benefit of the market. We're working really closely in partnership with others, I think is the other thing I would say. So uh, I think I've got many friends at this table, people I work with in different capacities. Um, both to help us with inputs for scenario analysis in the, in the case of Sabine, but also we're really keen to see if we can have as efficient a system as possible. If we can have banks to provide information which not only meets our requirements, but is relevant for their prudential supervision uh, or for their insurance supervision, then all the better. A more efficient reporting system I think would be good for us all. Now your second question, Ukraine. Has that done anything to put us off? Not at all. Um, like us, I think it makes it even more relevant, um, the work that we're doing. It's shown us the risk of supply chains, and one of the things we ask for is information about supply chain risk and the information that we're asking to be provided to the market. And also, where it does affect transition strategies that companies are coming up with, we all need to know what the effects are so we can change the planning accordingly our requirements would give that transparency to the market. So you could really see, OK, has something changed because of the risks of something like Ukraine? Let's get that information out there so we all know what we're dealing with. So, so no slowdown from our perspective. Thank you. Very good. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, Sue. Uh, let's move now to the, to the NGFS, you know, a body created not long ago, but have been incredibly active in putting forward an ambitious agenda of analysis and, and policy work on, on these matters by central banks and supervisory authorities. So I'm very happy to have here Sabine Mother, Vice Chair of the NGFS, who is going to tell us what is now on your table. Thank you, mm -hmm. Fernando. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a pleasure being here. Maybe i just give you a quick introduction of um, myself and, and the organization I'm representing here today. In my first capacity, I'm a board member of Deutsche Bundesbank, of the German Central Bank. In my second capacity, I'm vice chair of the Network for Greening the Financial System. This network, for those who are not familiar with it, was founded four years ago with eight members, um, so very small. And our goal was some central bankers and supervisors saw that there is something called climate risk, and we actually didn't know what to do with it, and we're pretty much you know, lost. And so we thought, OK, and let's be lost together. So the eight of us started in that way. And uh, what we all agreed on was that um, climate risk is a source of financial risk, and therefore at least it, is, it matters for financial stability. Um, so four years later, we're a little bit smarter and um, more informed, not well informed, but more informed. We have now uh, around 115 members. So within four years from eight to 115 members, center banks and supervisors. And just in case that somebody's in the room who's not member, please uh, rethink that. I think it's really, well, uh, it's really worth it. So what actually do, do we do? Um, we do have uh, certain areas we care. Um, our flagship is definitely uh, the scenario an analysis, which have been mentioned, especially by Sue, but also by the others. So what we do or have done already is we um, developed six different scenarios with three categories. Those categories are either a hot world with either, you know, we are looking at the current policies that are in place or you know, um, the commitments um, so far. Um, and we saw that with that, we most probably will have a global earth warming of 2.5 to 3 degrees. And then what we do in our scenario analysis is calculating what does this, uh, what kind of economic impact does this have? So what is with the global GDP, uh, productivity, prices, employment rate, and so on. The second category and, and um, scenario was like disorderly transition. 
So that means that political decision takers or makers at some point realize, oh my God, climate is not good for our economy, right? Um, and then all of a sudden they think, oh my God, we need a carbon tax. We need regulation in place. We need this and that. And then um, we most probably will see a high transitional risk materializing, right? Because the real economy did not have the time to adjust. So this is the second um, scenario. And the third one um, is an orderly transition. This is in the perfect world where we really start, uh, where pol not we, but the, the political area starts to put in place you know, taxation that are appropriate, uh, regulation that are appropriate, an investment framework where all, all the financial flows go into um, carbon neutrality and so on. And so that um, the real economy, especially, but also the financial institutions, have time to adjust. And, and then we most probably will see an uh, over growth warming of 1.5, most probably more 1.7. And um, at least it seems, of course, it still has an, an economic impact, but we will survive and we will be very happy. Unfortunately, this doesn't match what we see now. And uh, my personal view is that I do not know whether we will see this scenario. So that means that it's really serious. Um, Maybe just one because, you know, um, we, why do we do the scenario analysis? First of all, because I think for the financial stability reason, it matters very much. And we now see that so many different new standard setters or also news, um, new server consultants ask us and even some financial institutions, you know, we need this scenario analysis because we have to do estimations, calculations and so on. And so what we now decided at the Network for Greening the Financial System is that we now take a second edition of the scenario analysis. That means that we now take a time horizon, not 2050, what we did initially, now to 2030. Because then it's, you know, you get a little bit more grip on it, right? Second thing we will do is um, also um, get a, little, a closer look at various industries and um, regions because we see big, 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 big differences, right? So um, I leave it with here, Flex, and maybe just a quick view on what else, uh, what kind of products we else do. You know, uh, unfortunately, time is limited. Therefore, just a quick view on that. What we did is on banking supervision, we did several, uh, gave settle, uh, several guidance. What we collected was all practices on climate-related um, banking supervision. Our next step will be to look at or to look for best practices, what will be not so easy. When it comes to monetary policy, um, actually I'm, I'm representing a pretty conservative central bank and um, in this regard, you know, four years ago, don't touch monetary policy. Right, so I, I heard that message and it was clear and at that point I didn't get, you know, what should climate have to do with monetary policy. Four years later, I have a little clue about that. Mm -hmm. um, so actually what we, we started to do something um, regarding monetary policy but rather related to um, the whole operational framework. So. Um, to what extent does climate um, risk matter when we uh, evaluate uh, collaterals? How about the tenders, um, the targeted lending, um, and, and other things? So the next step we most probably do within the next two years is to have a look at our economic models, because how to integrate climate risk or other uh, ecological risk into our models? because we have here different time horizons, so longer time horizons, we have a lot of uncertainties and we have no experience at all. So this, this is the second thing, maybe just um, since, uh, Fernando, you also ask, well, what, what, how does re Ukraine have an impact on our work? Um, and I just echo what was said, but maybe I also take the, the, the chance to have a rather European view on that and, and, and share it with you. So um, 
especially in countries like Germany and Italy, who are so dependent on gas delivery from Russia, you see that all kind, the whole society reflects what's going on, right? And where do we get our energy from? And so what we now see, especially in my country, is that we now go back into energy we do not want, like coal, nuclear, and so on. But it's clear to us that this is just for one or two years. Till we, and at the same time, we know we now have to accelerate to get independent, independent from fossil fuel. And so what we, I see a further push into renewables, and we now look for partnerships uh, to African countries to get independent, to get that more diversified, right? And so I clearly see push towards, and maybe just also from an economical point, because in my country I always have to convince people why this is so important also economically, not only ecologically. Um, the thing is that now in Germany you see that um, power generated from um, solar or um, um, onshore wind is now cheaper than generating power from fossil fuels. So this is now the first turning point where it really economically makes sense. The only reason why we still need this other um, fossil fuel or fossil um, energy is because we are not there to, to, you know, to, to, to have enough uh, renewables. And therefore, I think it's now if, if some countries really start to show even economically it makes sense and from a geopolit geopolitical point as well, we will see a push. That's most probably what I see. So maybe last one, if I may, um, Fernando. Um, you know, in the last weeks, you know, I've, I've been invited to a lot of panels and when they realize I'm uh, in my first capacity of um, a central banker, they always keep inflation low. Don't talk about all those that doesn't matter, right? And um, actually, um, people are absolutely right. Our first and core mandate is price stability. And at the same time, climate has and will have a significant impact on prices. And therefore, you know, it is absolutely nonsense to say climate has nothing to do with inflation, right? I stop here, sorry, for being so long. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, very, very many thanks, uh, Sabine, for stimulating um, and comments, particularly the last part is quite provocative and interesting. I think sure that we can actually revisit those issues later. So let me uh, finalize this uh, first round of uh, questions to our panelists with uh, Martin Mourinho, who is going to talk about IOSCO, what, uh, what IOSCO is doing in this area of climate, uh, climate risk. Fernando, many thanks. And uh, it's great to be on a panel where the full complexity of these issues as they face the financial sector can be just seen within, within one hour. And um, uh, I'm almost, if you don't mind being slightly glib, I've been saying, yes, please do keep inflation low because everything I'm about to say will not be true if you don't. We'll be living in a, in a, in a different uh, uh, environment. So uh, one can only support that objective. Um, if you look at this issue from the point of view of securities markets, which is the perspective from which I look at it, um, you have to take a step back into the past in order to understand the quite dramatic things that have recently happened and therefore to understand the impact for uh, securities uh, standard setters and for securities regulators. Um, if you look back over the last 10 years at uh, uh, the environment that financial markets have been looking at, which financial markets are always looking, uh, um, this is, I talk about the various COP meetings, the uh, UN panel on, on, on climate change, a range of voluntary initiatives within industry and civil society that have sought to amplify voices in make, terms of making commitments in relation to carbon zero and, 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 and so on. And you also see actually, I think as part of that, the familiar long European legislative process to get change in, in, in relation and the ambition in relation to ESG within Europe, which is of course crucial to global financial markets. Markets respond to all of that, and they have responded in a particular way. And I'd say they've responded by the development of at least three different types of uh, uh, investors. Firstly, you've had the emergence of uh, what I might call, without trying to denigrate other investors, the ethical investors who, uh, who have developed standards uh, uh, in relation to ESG in terms of their mandates. And the reason why I differentiate them from a second group of investors 
uh, which should be evident in a moment, because there's a second group of investors who are very interested in many of the issues that come out in scenario analysis, which is the transition risk and where those companies are going to be as and when governments move to tighten regulation and, and uh, to change tax regimes and so on in relation to this. And markets necessarily anticipate that. And there's a third group of investors who are very common in financial markets, which is the investors who frankly go along for the ride. They are sort of trend investors and they go with other investors. It's a perfectly logical way to invest in markets. So all those investors in the markets have had a huge impact recently and has led to a situation where some $38 trillion by a recent estimate uh, in, in market investments currently have some form of ESG related uh, mandate. And that figure is likely to rise very quickly over the coming years. But it has some problems in relation to it. And what the markets have done in order to adopt those mandates and to implement those mandates is they've lengthened out their time horizons from the time horizons that they normally adopt. They normally look three to five years out. They're now looking very significantly further out in order to promote those, those mandates. And that means that markets have actually taken on a very significant amount of political risk insofar as they have adopted those mandates. Were it to be the case that governments were to fail to adopt the policies to control uh, uh, carbon, then a lot of those investment mandates, frankly, would in strict financial terms be in the wrong place. And one of the risks, which I think is quite interesting at this point in time, when you look at events like Ukraine and the questioning that you see from Ukraine ar around the commitment of government to this policy, is could that turn what has been a really soundly based trend within financial markets into a fad and you would see a reversal of those, of that, those uh, 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 mandates, which I think would not be a good thing for public policy uh, at all. Uh, the other aspect, by the way, uh, uh, of recent events, which is relevant, and I just echo what, what Dietrich said here, is the, is the specific area of commodities, and we're working very closely with the FSB on improving all our understanding of the very nuanced way in which commodities markets work. I can come back to that if people, if people wish to do so. The second risk that arises in the current situation, and we will definitely come back to this, I know Fernando intends to, is the area of greenwashing. And I won't say anything further about that at the moment. Just very quickly then, so what does IOSCO as a global standard setting organization think we should be doing to try to deal with that situation? We have a number of key initiatives here. One is been very well explained by Sue, which is to support a fundamental change in the quality of issuer information in the market. Because the market is currently an alphabet soup of information of different qualities, various voluntary private sector standards, which are very often conflicting or complex, really hard for investors to get their head around, create constant concerns around the integrity of markets. And we are working with Sue to try to change that. And the way to change that is to get the issuer information of good quality. If that issuer's inf information is of good quality, then a whole range of uh, uh, derivative analysis and information will become of good quality. Secondly, that information needs to be assured, audited. So we will be working to try to create a parallel initiative to the one that Sue is doing in relation to issue information to ensure that at a global level you're getting auditing and assurance standards applying to that information so that it's being checked and so there's accountability around the quality of that information. And thirdly, we have a specific in, uh, initiative on carbon markets, which I can come back to if, if that is, is uh, uh, of interest to people. I think the last thing I would say is um, uh, there's goodwill, I find, around the world in order to try to make this work. This transition to uh, adherence to ISSB standards or equivalent will not be tidy. Not will be, it will not be easy. And what will happen, it will not happen just by every country around the world saying, we follow the ISSB standard. But just because it's untidy doesn't mean we won't be able to uh, uh, achieve it. And I'm actually quite hopeful that we will be able to, to get there. Great. Martin, thank you very much. So we have completed the first round of, of questions. I now realize that uh, I have Basel-based organization on my left-hand side, and I have non-Basel-based organization <laughs> in, the, in the right-hand side. It was just by chance because for the alphabetical order. So let's go back to Basel, if you don't mind. <laughs> so, and then we are going to now allow all of you just to dig deeper into some of the issues that you have touched upon. Jonathan, you mentioned this uh, gap analysis that you have been conducting. So tell us something about the result of that. Do we have to change the, the 
insurance uh, core standards at all or not? I mean, uh, well, thanks, and and uh, happy to be in the Basel corner here, and uh, <laughs> I can say that uh, I also consistent with my colleagues in the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision who did their gap analysis, and I think we came to this, the same con conclusions really that uh, with regard to climate risk, we see it as a as a key driver of existing risks. Um, and, uh, and I, I guess that the key outcome of our gap analysis is that, the, that our standards, the insurance core principles or the ICPs, uh, are sufficiently principles-based uh, that they do already capture uh, climate risk. Um, I mean, f for instance, we, we've in our communication have always been quite clear that insurers should already be disclosing, publicly disclosing around their, their climate risks because it, uh, our standards say that supervisors should require insurers to, to disclose all material risks, and this is clearly, very clearly a, a material risk. Um, uh, but what we've also concluded, though, is that whilst, whilst it's, it, you know, it's, it's in there, uh, we do need to provide some more guidance to make it even more explicit how it is in there and how supervisors uh, should go about um, then addressing that uh, in their supervision of insurers. So uh, the focus will be less on changes to standards and more on uh, additional guidance uh, on how, to how supervisors should be looking to uh, require insurers to, to incorporate climate-related risks into their day-to-day -day operations. We already did uh, some number of guidance on this, but we'll be moving to, an, uh, to further supporting material, um, which will be, you know, over the over the course of next year, uh, engaging quite extensively with stakeholders uh, and really, I guess, I guess, a deeper dive on a number of areas. Some areas which we didn't touch on in our original work, such as the market conduct uh, aspects of climate risk uh, and what that means for conduct supervisors as well. Um, one other area where we're doing particular work, uh, and, and, and others have already touched on it, is, is on climate risk scenario analysis uh, and what supervisors are doing there. Um, you know, we, we're building off the work of the NGFS uh, and others, but really trying to bring an insurance sector uh, perspective to it. Um, and uh, we've done a stock take, or we're doing a stock take, stock take and engaging with stakeholders really to first of all get a sense of the, the <laughs> what the range of practices are out there but uh, um, uh, from that taking two further steps the first is is really with a capacity building uh, uh, focus um, because there are pioneers in this space amongst the supervisory community but there are many supervisors who need to learn uh, so, very thankful that we're working closely with the FSI uh, on that. So, thank you very much for that, Fernando. Um, and also, uh, thank you to NGFS uh, Secretariat for, for all the collaboration and uh, support on this as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I think one other thing we're hoping to, to get out of this is, is uh, that uh, certainly the feedback that we get from the, from the sector, from the insurers themselves, is the challenges they face in terms of what they what they regard as a as a burden of reporting uh, to supervisors on the different types of scenarios that they're asked to report on uh, in different jurisdictions. So if a if a spin-off of this is some increased uh, harmonisation around that, that that uh, I think will be viewed as a plus as well. Um, uh, so yes, I think. That, that pretty much covers it. Uh, lots of work ahead, but I'm also very pleased with the, the level of collaboration. Thanks. Okay, many thanks. Uh, many thanks, uh, Jonathan. Let me now uh, move to, to Dietrich. I think uh, by reading this important report that you, you have produced on, on supervision regulatory approaches in relation to climate uh, related financial risk, you seem to point to the idea that so it's not enough just to work with micro prudential regulation, of course, if something is macro, it's certainly climate change. Therefore, you really want to address the systemic implications of climate <coughs> financial regulation in the macro prudential approach. 
Certainly, it's, it's not fully straightforward to see how the current macroprudential framework would actually be used for such a purpose. A number of trade-offs actually could, could be identified. So what do you have in mind when you think about you know, a macroprudential complement to microprudential actions? Hmm? Very good question. Um, I think I think the starting point for um, the discussion considerations around a potential macroprudential approach to to climate risk is is the pervasiveness of these risks, climate related risks, including physical risk, transition risk, liability risk, may be transmitted across the financial system through various transmission channels, may be amplified by the financial system, including across borders and across sectors. So, in other words, climate risk, one way or the other, is is everywhere in the financial system, and. Macroprudential tools alone, which are typically focused on direct exposures, may not sufficiently address adequately capture the cross-sectoral, global, and systemic dimensions of climate-related risks. So against this backdrop, the, the report, our report, um, presents some of the early thinking, and I emphasize early thinking, um, on um, potential macroprudential approaches, drawing on the literature and work of standard setters and authorities. Um, so the report um, lists a couple of examples which show that current considerations, suggestions go in quite different directions. Uh, for example, the EU, ECB, ESRB are examining the use of systemic risk buffers in response to unaddressed systemic climate risk. Bank of England is undertaking further analysis to explore possible adjustments to capital adequacy requirements. Um, there are other measures contemplated, for instance, OECD and academia are suggesting large exposure limits related to climate risks. And yet another measure that has been suggested is uh, by researchers is a type of climate capital buffer that would be adjusted depending on the evolution of carbon intensive credit to GDP. Now, behind these different proposals and considerations stand, I think, deep and quite challenging questions. One is whether climate-related macroprudential instruments should be fixed and structural, akin perhaps to a GSIP surcharge or something like that, um, um, or time-varying. And the answer to that question may depend on the precise goal of the instrument, for instance, whether to provide an absolute cushion against climate risks, or whether to vary buffers relative to progress in reducing carbon emissions and uh, progress in, in transition plans. Another issue, related issue, obviously, concerns the precise relationship between climate risk and other potential sources of systemic risk, and as a consequence, the calibration of, of macroprudential instruments. As I said, these are these are very, very difficult questions and um, um, important ones. The debate is, is at the beginning and um, I hope that we will see in the coming, coming months and years um, uh, a lively debate and uh, interesting contributions around that. Um, I think what these, these issues illustrate is um, that the development of a macroprudential approach to financial risk, an effective macroprudential approach, will depend also critically on progress in the other areas that we've been talking about and that are part of our roadmap. Disclosures um, are the fundamental um, building block, if you like, for, for, for managing climate risks. Data um, and, of course, vulnerability assessment, not least based on reliable um, uh, scenario analysis. Um, let me conclude with, with one remark. Um, I think when we talk about um, all the financial sector measures uh, to address climate risk, it is important not to forget that probably the first best solution to address climate risk would be a comprehensive carbon tax. And that, that we are probably operating here in the space of second best or so, and that, that we should not, especially in the political debate, forget about this, um, this first best solution, market-based solution that is out there and should be used. Very good. Thank you very much for the clarity of your last statement. I think it's very, very important. Uh, Neil, you mentioned that you, I mean, the Basel Committee is now working on this uh, holistic uh, approach, trying to see to which extent the different pillars of the Basel framework will need to be adjusted in order to probably, probably cope with climate-ready financial risk. 
Let us say a bit more about the methodological challenges that you have to face in order to touch, particularly the two regulatory or you know, the two more normative type of, uh, type of uh, pillars, regulation and supervision. What are the methodological issues you have to deal with uh, at present in order to come up with a consistent uh, approach? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Fernando. I think you can hear me this time. Uh, firstly, I, I totally agree with uh, Dietrich's uh, last point. Um, I think you know climate change ultimately it's, is going to need government regulation. That's taxes or subsidies we're dealing here in, in, in second and third best uh, solutions at best. I think, and and that's why our focus is is very much on um, on risk to the banking system. Um, Fernando, I think you're right uh, to point to the unique challenges associated with designing uh, regulation uh, to address uh, climate-related financial risks. I think uh, in your introduction, uh, you, you pretty much touched, uh, touched on all the, um, all the methodological challenges uh, that we do face, the long time horizons, uh, the need to be more forward-looking, uh, the data gaps, which we've touched uh, on a lot in this panel, uh, the, the high level of uncertainty. Um, I, I think for me the easiest way to illustrate um, these challenges is just to think that when, you, when, when you're trying to design a regulatory fra uh, framework, um, ultimately you have to address a number of uh, quantification challenges. And so for banking, uh, you, the first question you have to ask yourself is what is a bank's exposure? What is the direct and indirect exposure? So that's not, a, not an easy thing to answer. We, can we do it now accurately? Probably, probably not. Um, but, you know, the work that the ISSB and others are doing on data will, will certainly help. Um, what is the size of losses that a bank could face, whether it be credit, market, operational related losses? Again, not, a, not an easy question to answer, particularly if you start off, start off with a data gap. Um, the third one is like when? when. When could this all materialize? You know, we don't know the sort of the trade-off between you know, the transition and physical risks and, and, and when the events actually occur, will they be over a long period, will they be sudden? And so then the timing element, I think, adds another complication. Uh, a fourth element is if you hit a stress period, is it going to be like historical stress periods that we're used to that, that occur in the macro economy? Is it going to be uh, something completely different? Um, and then the last element is, you know, something we'd normally look at uh, when we're designing capital regulation is, you know, what mitigating actions can banks take? You know, can they, can they hedge the risk? Can they transfer the risk um, in some way? Uh, and again, that's an incredibly uh, difficult thing to answer, uh, answer right now. Um, so these are all questions we would ask ourselves when we're designing capital regulation. Um, in, the in the case of climate risk, I think they're just more difficult to answer because we don't have the data we don't have the understanding of the historical uh, relationships. Um, and, and so that's why I think the approach that we've taken necessarily has to start with sort of general risk management practices to try and improve um, uh, risk management, try and improve supervision, try and imp uh, improve uh, uh, the data gaps. Uh, it's, I think it's only once we've done that that we get a su sufficient level of comfort uh, will we really be able to you know, pin down a, uh, uh, a fairly detailed, if you like, uh, uh, capital regulation. I, I think the work on stress testing is really important in the scenario analysis. I think that sort of brings to fore all, uh, all these challenges. Uh, and I think ultimately uh, uh, that's kind of the avenue uh, that we'll have to go down to, uh, you know, if we end up with a, with a capital-based uh, charge that it, it will have to build off work in, in the stress testing area, I think. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, many thanks. And certainly many important, complex methodological challenges that the, the, the committee will have to analyze in order to come up with uh, concrete, uh, concrete uh, action. Thanks for this. Right, so let's now move uh, downstream in the river. So we go to Frankfurt, actually. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, less. Uh, so I think I, I was struck by by the description you made of the contents of these new exposure drafts that you have published. What's an important element is you want actually sort of firms to report not only on, on exposures, but also on, 
on their own resilience. So that's about uh, they want them to report on the strategies they are actually following, following in order to properly manage those, those risks. So could you be more concrete? What do you expect firms actually to, to report or to disclose uh, if they want actually to meet your, your standards? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, so yes, so the part of the exposure draft that you're alluding to is not just asking for sort of what are your exposures now, but helping those um, advancing funding to an entity to understand what the future prospects look like. So when you're trying to work out the value of the shares of a company, for example, you sort of want a picture of the future. And so one of the things that we ask for in the document is for information about the resilience of a company's strategy to climate change. And so it sort of gets to what Sabine was talking about. So if you think about the uncertainty of the future, what different paths might you um, need to follow um, in response to that? And, and, and investors want to understand that. So what information are we, are we asking for and what might we see? There's really two types of information that we're looking for. And the first is... Um, a discussion of, um, what, of what the effect would be on the way that a company would run its business, so what its strategy would be for its business model, and what the effects they think that would be in terms of how they could use their assets, whether assets would be stranded, whether they could be put to new use, what their access to funding might look like, and what their effect on their future profitability might be in these different scenarios. So that's the sort of objective of the, of the analysis. Now, one of the things personally that I'm hoping to do with this is not just to get this information out there, but actually to make sure that companies are thinking about these things. You know, making sure that by asking for this information that boards are having these discussions about, you know, what their future strategy might look like in different climate outcome scenarios. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Then there's the how did you do the analysis, and so this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. And we've tried to be sort of proportionate in our document. We know that there are some who are already quite sophisticated doing the sorts of analysis that Sabine was talking about, so climate-related scenario analysis. Some are quite advanced in that, particularly those who are very exposed to climate change, so those in, in, in mining, etc. They may have more work in this area. If a company can do climate-related scenario analysis, we ask them to do it. We say, if you can do climate-related scenario analysis, that should be what you do to do this resilient analysis. If you can't, you can do something simpler. And that may be more qualitative or, or one outcome. It might be one assumption. But in either case, we ask for a description of what assumptions they used, what scenarios did they use. If they used scenarios, how closely aligned were they to a Paris-aligned scenario? And we really want to understand the assumptions around that. So it's trying to give a picture of the thought process that the company has gone through um, and the analysis that they used. And also by saying, if you can do climate-related scenario analysis, Emmanuel and I, the chair and vice chair, were very much trying to give a steer to the market that this is where we want you to be heading. You might not be able to do it today, but this is the aspiration. It needs to be more quantitative, not just descriptions and, and qualitative narrative discussion. We really want to encourage um, this more sophisticated quantitative analysis. That's a proposal, of course, so I'm going to be really interested to see what feedback we get on this, and we're going to have to be careful to make sure it's scalable as well. What's possible in some parts of the world may not be so possible in other parts of the world, and what's possible for more sophisticated, larger companies may be different to what a smaller company can do. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what we hear, but that's the dream. Very good, thank you very much, uh, Sue. Now let's move to, uh, to Sabine. I think we have already been actually uh, discussing, uh, looking at the intervention of previous speakers, that is a, a question mark around what should be actually the role of the financial sector, what is should be actually the role of regulation. I mean, you have been thinking about that a lot. Of course, there are like two schools of thought. One is that you should focus on protecting the safety and soundness of financial institutions. You therefore have to take into account this new source of risk, which is climate change, and therefore adapt your standards uh, to cope properly with those risks. This is one school of thought. Second school of thought is a slightly more, more ambitious, ambitious, which is basically there is a role for regulation to directly contribute to a smooth transition, a transition to, to a more sustainable economy, maybe as a second best, as, uh, as the three was suggesting. What, what is your view about that? I'm sure that you have interesting remarks to make on this. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. 
uh, I would like to pick up what uh, Dietrich already said. I think carbon neutrality will, will only happen if the externalities are priced in. So no, the, the harm carbon does needs to be you know, paid for, and this is not the case so far. So the easiest thing and the most effective thing is a market-driven approach. So if carbon has a price, a decent price, then you know, we will see the market shifting. But this is an ideal world, um, and this currently is nothing I see so far, uh, at least not in the near future. Um, I mean, there are discussions at the G20 level, um, and I think all economists uh, wherever, from whatever country they are, they agree that carbon taxation is the most effective tool. Um, the only thing, and not only, but the most challenging uh, thing that goes in line with carbon taxation is how do you compensate all those social issues, right? And this is politically the most challenging question. So what do we do? I think on the one hand, we really have to push G20 to find a solution over the next years. And there are some suggestions around what I think uh, are very promising. Um, at the same time, you know, we need to <coughs> to look for the, you know, for the second alternative. It's not even the second best, but you, know, you cannot just do nothing. So what I think is that most important is for now that market has the chance to price in climate risk. And that's what Sue also said and others said. I mean, market is so far not capable to really price it appropriately in because there is the lag not only of data at all, but a high, with, with quantitative data that are comparable, reliable, have a high quality standard. This is something we are missing so far. So what, um, in general, we did at the NGFS a lot of service, but one I would like to share with you, it's about market transparency, because as I said, well, we need market to price and carbon risk. So we had a look at what is done so far globally in market transparency. And what we saw is maybe three things that's needed. Whoopsie, time off. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I'm, I accelerate, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> good. So what what is needed definitely is first of all, you know, we need a definition of what really means sustainability. So although, especially in Europe, there's a big debate and you know arguments around, do we need such monsters like taxonomy? Right? Yes, we do. The question is just, you know, how do they look like? And we at the survey saw that. Globally, we have 26 taxonomies either in place or at work, right? So 26 is quite a lot. Unfortunately, they are completely different. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's not only the way, you know, what they think what is sustainable, but also the way, you know, they set up the taxonomies. So some are rather um, principle-based. We see this, for example, in Malaysia and other Asian countries. Then we do have those who are the, the the technical, uh, the real experts who say, well, technical screening criteria, do we see this in Europe? What leads to an extremely complex document, which is completely, you know, it's really difficult to implement this, especially for smaller or medium-sized com uh, companies. And then you have a whitelist. So these three cat categories. So. It's great to see such, such kind of taxonomies, but you know there is missing a global approach. What we so far see is that the European Union and China are just right now working on, on a common ground taxonomy, so something which is really the real basic word. And I would really looking forward if other regions you know, would also reach out and find at least a little bit of a common ground, right? So, Definition taxonomies are important. The second thing is disclosure, and you know, here are all the experts on, on disclosure. I do not want to repeat that, but we see also a lot of different uh, disclosure regimes. Um, what makes it very difficult because many disclosure regimes do not cover a lot of the real economy, unfortunately. So you see only the real the capital market um, corporates, which are non forced to disclose or you know we have a lot of qualitative um, demands so well 
it's nice if you have a, a report of 500 pages and on the footnote on page 360 says you, climate is no, doesn't matter, we have everything in place. Um, so we really need data, right, comparable data. And the third thing which is really needed to price in is um, auditors, independent and licensed auditors who are capable of really, um, you know, auditing whether this that is meant to be or investments or issuance that are, you know, named and called sustainable, are they really sustainable, right? And so far, it's not just a lack of standards, but also of auditors who are licensed, independent, and capable of doing so. So these things. And maybe um, having said all this, is what, what is the solution then? I think that you know, my neighbors here are so important because what really, markets are global, and therefore we need global solutions. Of course, we have to start on a region, regional basis because otherwise nothing will happen, right? Um, but now, in taking the, the IFRS um, standards, I think 166 countries, or how many are covered? 140. 140, so, but still a lot, right? So if we now see the opportunity to have 140 countries or jurisdictions who have the same reporting standards, qualitative reporting standards, I think this would be a major step. So let's, I'm really looking forward to your approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Before I ask the question to, to Martin, let me remind you that we are going to open the Q&A session immediately after. Uh, those who are actually connecting virtually, you can, of course, use any time the chat function. I will try, actually, our panelists to address your, your questions or to comment on your comments. Martin, uh, greenwashing, you mentioned that, which is, of course, an important element of the discussion about this. I understand you have uh, look at uh, this issue intensively, particularly in the context of your work on asset management companies and, and, and sustainability related policies by, by, by MCs. So, could you please share with us? Yeah, greenwashing what, is what actually is, the other what side is your of all this. Yeah. To this. Yeah. Um, you know, so being talked about uh, getting to this uh, outcome that, uh, that Sue was trying to push towards. And, and if you ask an uncomfortable question, which is, how long is it going to take to get there? When is the first year when we're going to see a set of suitably audited accounts from major corporates uh, done in accordance with ISSB standards? I don't think you can say any sooner than 2025. W on a bad day, if things don't go well, it could be 2026, it could be 2027 uh, before you get this really around the world. That means we've got three to five years left of a gap in which greenwashing is endemic within the, uh, uh, within the uh, uh, securities markets. And what I mean by greenwashing is something very simple. It's simply the misrepresentation of what you are capable of achieving in relation to uh, ESG goals that you have uh, uh, adopted or mandates that you've been given by your, your clients. So we see this as a huge issue for uh, securities markets. It's a massive reputational issue for them. And I'm glad I got that as well. So yeah. that proves you're not the only one. <laughs> anyway, uh, it really is a big issue for them. Uh, uh, and, and what can we do about it at, at, at uh, IOSCO's level? Firstly, I should say, in analyzing it, and we have analyzed it in three reports that we issued last year, the heart of greenwashing is at the asset management level. And uh, the two other aspects of it are at the issuer level, but also at the rating agency level. So let me just mention what I mean by it in, in relation to asset managers first. So I spoke there about the commitments asset managers have made in relation to sustainability targets and, and goals in the context of a lot of public pressure upon them to do so. And the way that drove up the rate of investor mandates with a sustainability or ESG uh, 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 focus. They have taken on those mandates and in terms of their competitive environment they've actually gone out and competed against each other in order to get those mandates for that 38 trillion that i spoke about earlier and in doing so they have taken advantage of a long-term feature of the way investment man mandates in the fund sector are run one which regulators have long since accepted which is that they allow investment funds to operate under relatively vague or general mandates. 
Now, that's always been a good thing because it allows investment managers to respond to changes in the environment and not to be, uh, not to be overly focused as a result of excessively specific mandates from their clients, which end up disadvantaging the clients, and then you can't change the mandate in a changed circumstance. The problem is when you're in the current environment with that and you have asset managers under pressure to make ESG commitments, they make vague ESG commitments and then they don't live up to them. And that is quite widespread. I think it was Sweden that did a, a, a recent survey of some 400 funds in its jurisdiction and found that about 5% of them were profoundly unsatisfactory. And I suspect the numbers in some other countries would be higher if you did an analogous number in those countries. Um, it happens in all sorts of ways, but fundamentally what the asset managers do is they label a fund, sometimes relabeling an existing fund as an ESG fund, and they then either sometimes do nothing in relation to the investment management to reflect that. Sometimes they say something like, well, we may take it into account, so they erratically take it into account now and then. And sometimes they use a filter. A filter mechanism is a well-recognized mechanism in investment uh, ma uh, uh, funds management. Uh, and they will filter to an extent, but there's a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation of marketing appear uh, material about what that filter does. So that's the core of greenwashing. If you then turn to the, to the rating agencies, because one of the things the asset managers do to deal with the fact they don't have enough resources is they rely on rating agencies. And many of you who were around pre-2008 will remember that we had a huge problem with excessive reliance on rating agencies in a very different context before 2008. Or well, we have it now, again, in relation to ESG-related ESG uh, rating agencies. And the problem is that those agencies are have to exercise a high level of judgment in relation to the ratings that they give, a very high level of judgment. They very often are correct, collecting data bilaterally from the, from the companies rather than using publicly available data, which isn't always available to all of them. And then they are themselves, of course, not regulated. And they uh, are gaps in the coverage, which means that investment strategies are distorted and move into the areas where the rating agency, ratings are, are available. So none of that is particularly satisfactory. I guess the only good thing about the way the, the, uh, these agencies are working at the moment is a lot of them work on, the, uh, on a subscription model, which means that you don't have the problems we used to have with issuer models and still do uh, issuer-funded models in relation to, to credit ratings. Um, all that is something we have tried to deal with. At IOSCO level, we're dealing with it ourselves by directly addressing industry and industry associations through a call for action from industry associations to try to create a degree of opprobrium within the industry around these practices. We've had some success with that kind of initiative in the past, so we hope that it will try to push down the rate of greenwashing in the, in the sector. But ultimately, the regulators are having to take action in individual jurisdictions. So you see actions which vary depending on the style of, of supervision and regulation in the different jurisdictions. In the United States, you saw a very recent uh, uh, $1.5 million uh, fine for uh, BNY Mellon, uh, uh, which was an indicator of more to come. They just opened a very substantial investigation into Goldman Sachs. In, um, in a country like France, let's say the securities regulator has told us publicly that it's gone out into bilateral engagement with a, a lot of asset managers to try to fix this problem. You see ESMA at Europe focusing not only on issuing additional guidance, but also trying to make sure all the different regulators around Europe are operating to the same standard in dealing with this, with this issue. So it's quite a complex picture. It's an ongoing uh, battle. It's not going to be easy to manage. It's a containment function more than a resolution function, frankly. I don't think we're going to make this problem go away. But one of the reasons why it is particularly reputationally difficult is because there are so many people who care so, so passionately about this issue. So what the asset managers are finding in a, an interestingly complex uh, uh, pattern of behavior is they hire people to form sustainability units. They go, they hire the experts who are out there in the marketplace. Those experts see what the asset managers are doing. Then they leave and they condemn the asset managers that they used to be uh, part of and condemn their, their behavior as a result. It's a degree of whistleblowing in public on a sort of civic society basis. That we have not seen, I think, in financial services in relation to many other issues. But it's one that's going, I think, to continue. And this is going to continue to be a controversial area. 
Great. Many thanks, uh, Martin. Many thanks, uh, all the speakers, for the incredibly interesting and insightful remarks on the work they are conducting and related issues. So now it's time, actually, to open the floor for questions, comments, remarks. I see that uh, Joshi would like to intervene. Yeah. You introduce yourself, Yoshi. Yoshi Kawai, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, from OECD. Uh, anyway, I have a lot of friends in this panel. <laughs> so my question is, uh, just having heard this, you know, uh, greenwash and so on, disclosure is still a long way to go. But assuming that we have a very high, uh, high quality, consistent, globally consistent disclosure is achieved, from the financial regulatory point of view, the most important policy uh, is qu quantitative policy, as uh, some, some of the regulators uh, side mentioned. In other words, capital charge, or how much you put on in number. So my question, particularly to regulator side, Basel side, you know. <laughs> so how do you see, of course, you know, scenario testing and so on, it's quite diverse and it's not easy to comparable, to make it comparable. But assuming that we are getting there, and also long-term uh, risk and so on, but assuming that we are getting to short-term you know, analysis is possible. Could you tell me a little bit your perspective of how you know, this uh, climate-related risk is quantifiable in a global way and reflect to the capital or quant quantifiable or quantitative requirement like Basel or IC ICS? or you know, so a, a little bit uh, Dietrich alluded to. So just that is my question, thanks. Okay, very direct question. So what are going to be the capital requirements associated to climate related <laughs> financial risk? <laughs> eh? Let's start with, let's start with Neil this time. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> good, good question. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think as I was, you know, trying to explain in my, in my earlier intervention, um, I mean, obviously you need you need the data uh, first. So let's let's assume we have the data, um, and then from that data, can you actually quantify, you know, losses in an extreme scenario? So when, whenever we think of capital requirements, what why is capital there? There's a downturn scenario. There's some extreme event, and what will the losses be? Um, so provided you can do that, then it's very straightforward, right? The, the capital charge covers your losses in a you know 99.9% .9 level of confidence. Uh, um, that that's the final bit is the easy part, Yoshi. The, the difficult part is working out what is that loss um, going to be and how how does that loss um, vary by you know the whole range of counterparties uh, that a bank has from you know, large corporates to SMEs to retail clients, um, even to a even to a single client. Let's let's say you have a automobile customer who's relying total on totally at present on you know fossil fuels and is transitioning to being an electric car manufacturer. How do, how do you deal with that? So. Yeah, I think the more you think about it, the more difficult uh, it, it, it kind of gets to, to, to get a precise quantitative uh, measure of what the losses will be. But if you know what the losses will be, then that's, that's the easy part. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. <laughs> well, well that, that's what I was trying to get at before. Like, if you want to take action under pillar two as a, as a banking supervisor, and you're gonna charge an additional capital requirement just because it's in pillar two, you still need to have some sort of confidence that the charges you're imposing uh, are reasonable, right? So that's what I was trying to say that, you know, it's easier, it is easier to, to start with the supervision and disclosure. It does have the advantage of flexibility. You don't sort of hardwire it in the regulation so you can be a bit more flexible. But ultimately, if you're a banking supervisor going to a bank and saying, you know, you need an additional 2% or whatever, you still ha need to have some confidence in your estimates. Um, so it's, it makes it a little bit easier, but it, it's, it, do it doesn't sort of get away from, from the sort of methodological and data challenges, I don't think. Well, I'm going to give the floor now to Jonathan. 
but I think it's, it's, it's about uncertainty. Uh, it's about the long horizons, and it's about actually if something is going to happen in the middle, right? So the banks are going to react to that. So how do you actually sort of take into account that, that reaction by the banks themselves uh, when actually assessing what losses would actually uh, be actually identified, and therefore what type of you know capital requirements you believe in a, in a very short term? That's that's a you know sort of a combination of difficult elements that make capital requirements maybe not immediately the most effective tool to, to deal with that. But so, so I have one, one more comeback. I mean, the alternative scenario is kind of what Dietrich uh, alluded to, that you just say, okay, we know this risk will materialize, we can't be so precise, mm -hmm. and then you, you try and cover it with some sort of general sort of buffer or uh, something like that. That, that. That's an alternative approach, definitely. You still have to calibrate it. You still have to calibrate it, yes. Yeah, so uh, Jonathan, please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think no, not a lot to add, um, but other, other than, I guess, saying, I mean, the insur in the insurance side, there is a, a, little, a little bit of a, at least a, one advantage that a lot of the, the capital charges do tend to be forward-looking, scenario-based uh, capital charges in, in many uh, uh, regimes. So that helps, but even, even so, I, I agree, it's, it's going to be quite a long journey to get to that point because of the, all we've heard th today about um, disclosure issues, taxonomy issues, data issues. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, I, 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 can, I can safely say within the IIS, it's not a, an imminent uh, standard that we're going to be w working on. But having said that, um, I, I would maybe add a word on to support the points that were made around transition plans and I mean in the insurance sector there's this concept particularly in Europe of, of own risk and solvency assessments this this sort of forward looking this idea of a forward looking assessment of 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 what the risk what the material risks are and and what is your plan to respond to them I think this is going to have to be key to to a climate risk response and I, I do think perhaps a role for capital where uh, more, more sort of pillar two, where, where supervisors are not convinced that insurers are, or financial institutions are doing a particularly good job around that, uh, mm -hmm. there may have to be some some discretion there. Many thanks, Jonathan. Any intervention on this? I'm not supposed to discuss about potential issues. Absolutely, right? that's all. Keep my mouth shut. <laughs> 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 Very good, thank you. Any, any other question from the audience? Please go ahead. on? Okay. Uh, I'm Nahla Hafiz from Central Bank of Egypt. Uh, I, I want to ask two questions, please. Uh, number one is an extension to the question that was just raised, uh, uh, the issue of pillar one and pillar two, uh, capital charge. Is it expected uh, in the near future that um, uh, Basel, the, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision uh, can set certain uh, standard models for quantifying the capital charge on the levels uh, of the uh, whole banking sectors uh, in different jurisdictions, or uh, will uh, will uh, the BCBS depend on uh, the ICAP, the internal capital adequacy uh, process uh, within each bank, and leave it to, to discretionary to banks' uh, policies? Uh, this is number one. Number two, um, uh, Mr. Martin, can you um, clarify more uh, uh, about greenwashing, please? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, on the um, oh, sorry, you want me to go? Okay. Um, on the the pillar one versus uh, pillar two approach. I mean, the way we're approaching it is is basically all three pillars at once in terms of the work we're doing. Uh, so we're trying to develop the best approaches we think that are feasible now under pillar one. Um, We've started work already on supervision, but there's still, I think, more to do uh, on pillar two, and I think that sort of uh, melds into the work uh, on stress testing. Um, and the work on disclosure continues. So so for the moment, there's no, there's no conclusion. There's no, it'll be pillar one or pillar two. Uh, it's very much, let's do the work. Let's try and come up with what we think are the best options 
given sort of what we know now, what data we have now, and then take a decision as to um, what's the best combination. It could be pillar one, it could be pillar two, maybe some combination, it could just be uh, disclosure of pillar two. So yeah, work ongoing, no decision yet, the short answer. To be continued, so um, Martin, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, I suppose the thing about, the, the best way maybe to think about greenwashing is to think about an asset manager who is not doing his job properly. And uh, what should you do as a regulator to try to get them back on track? And there are sort of two or three levels to that. One is at a firm level, does the asset manager have uh, a sufficient focus on ESG issues in its senior uh, governance uh, uh, fora? And secondly, does it have an overview of the key ESG risks, which it then inputs into its different investment strategies? If the answer to that question is yes on both points, then uh, that firm, at least, is in a, a very uh, good position. But if you then move down to the product level, you almost have to ask the same things all over again. So firstly, you want to ask, does the name of that fund, is it consistent with uh, the actual investment strategy that the fund has got? Does the mar is the marketing material consistent with the actual investment strategy that it's got? And is there a risk analysis at fund level in relation to the investment strategies that they have adopted that takes into account ESG issues. And that's different from my first question about at firm level, is there a risk, is there a good risk analysis? Because you could have a really good risk analysis at firm level, but you don't actually funnel it down into the way you actually uh, do your investment management at the individual product level. And then, and this is a particularly important point, is there an ongoing uh, monitoring of in, at an investment by investment level of what is happening from an ESG perspective in relation to the assets that have been invested in. Because it's very easy, and if the plumbing here is very well established, you invest in assets, you see if they're profitable, if they're continuing to develop the way you need them to, to develop in terms of financial performance, and that's how you assess the product. But once you have taken on a mandate to say we will look at impact or we will look at governance issues or diversity or your involvement in the arms trade or whatever it, it happens to be, your, your carbon emissions. Then once you take on that, then you are obliged, in addition to your classic perform, uh, uh, performance uh, assessment process, to have an ESG performance assessment process. And an awful lot of asset managers have not put the resources into uh, having those facilities uh, available. And all that, it seems to me, is at the heart of the asset management problem with greenwashing. And when you then see public debate, as we do currently, between people saying, you know, this is all rubbish that ESG is always going to outperform other asset classes, and saying, oh my God, is all this ESG investing then a complete waste of time? Then what you're doing is you're having an interaction between ESG skeptics on the one hand, and silly marketing material on the other hand, and they can easily prove that the silly marketing material was false. The asset manager should never have said things like, and unfortunately some of them have said this, that uh, ESG will systematically, continuously, and always outperform other asset classes. Well, there isn't an asset in the world that always continuously and systematically and always outperforms other asset classes. So it is not going to be true of this. So it's very easy for the cynics and the skeptics to undermine ESG investing with those sort of comments because of that weak marketing material. So you get this sort of false debate in public and you've seen it all over the, paper, all over the pages of the financial press recently, der deriving not from whether ESG investing is a good or bad thing, but because of the nonsense that has been that that has been associated with some of the ESG uh, 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 fervor that is that is out there. May Thank, I, please, Irina. Yeah. Yeah. May, may I just support what Martin said? Um, I think your your question is, is perfect because it really shows that you know even we do not know what really is green, right? 
and it definitely shows that there's a lack of standards and common understanding. So I think this is, uh, I'm, I'm glad you dared to ask this question. The second point is, and that really to support you, I think this whole debate about this ESG label, right, is completely to the, you know, it, it really um, is not to the point because what is really we are talking about is that we need transition, mm -hmm. that we need to finance the transition. And so, <laughs> You know, ESG labeling usually is about you put uh, companies, corporates in this basket, which anyhow are not productive or have no carbon incentive productivity. And most of the time you do not even uh, take into account the, the supply chain. So you find banks in there, you find online services and so on. So what the hell does this do with the transformation? It's no good, you know, it doesn't add value to the transformation process. And therefore, you know, what is ESG about? It doesn't help ones, not, at all, not in the way we see it now. So from my understanding, let me take Europe and also Asia, because we are bank, or those two regions are bank-based. To my understanding, on the me medium to long run, we all have to look at, you know, um, when you give loans, it is important to look at the climate risk or the, the, the carbon exposure of this client, right? This is the approach of the future and not isolating this marketing success story um, we, you know, does, that doesn't help us in the transformation process. So therefore, I think it's very important that we know, you know, even think on the broader perspective, we, what, how do we get really to net zero and how can we finance this process? That's what matters. A lot of it isn't even about climate. Yeah, exactly. Is it, you know, is a defence stock a good thing or a bad thing? So that's the other complication, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, great, mate. Thanks. Let me uh, take a cup of four questions and then you get the floor to the to the panelists. Over there, you have Jean Pierre and two ladies over here. Thank so. you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, please yes. go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dominique Burgeon. I'm from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And I must say at the outset, definitely not an audience I'm used to, to interact with. But, but listening to you, I found really the, 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 the panel discussion very, very interesting. And basically, in our sector, we have, a, we have a big challenge. We have 10 billion people to feed by 2050. And we have currently over 800 million people facing hunger and we are now as we speak you know in a food crisis um, as part of the set of action that is needed to transform the food sector we need um, massive investment massive in investment to increase the production but also to transform the sector for its greening including to inc to decrease the dependence on on uh, uh, chemical fertilizers, for example, which, by the way, heavily depend on the price of gas. Uh, so, in, in the meantime, the agriculture sector is one that is one of the most affected by the impact of climate change. Uh, as a matter of fact, 25% of the total cost of disasters that are climate related are absorbed by the agriculture sector. So, it means that the agriculture sector is a high risk area for investments. And uh, so my question to you is, how can you help? How can you help uh, de-risking investment? How can you help make sure that indeed investments in the large scale investments in the agriculture sector can be made? Unusual question, sorry, but thank you. Great, thank you very much. Very interesting question, of course. Jean-Pierre over there, and then we go. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. I'm uh, Sirai here from the National Bank of Cambodia. And maybe just to follow up uh, from his question um, is that the, the issues with climate change is usually the people who are living in developing countries who are the most vulnerable. And yet, the financing into the ESG or climate related into these uh, regions are very much lacking. There's lack because obviously the, 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 what was raised is the lack of data, right? And you can argue that over time we can gather enough data and build something uh, credible for investment in those regions. 
but we don't have the time. So my question is, do you think uh, we should change the way we do risk assessment um, and, and particularly in from the rating agencies uh, to Mr. Martin point where you know, most of the investors look at uh, Standard and & Poor's and Fitch rating, etc. And most of the time, the weight is given to credit risk and not so much on uh, ESG risk. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Yes, okay, thank you, Jean-Pierre Dantin, formerly from the Swiss National Bank, now with uh, Enterprise for Society. Uh, what uh, academic study clearly shown is that excluding stocks from portfolios is simply useless. That's not the right way. That's not how you're going to get any impact. If finance is to have impact, it's by finan financiers, asset owners, using their power to move, to change companies that they are, for which they are, that of, of which they are owners. This clearly means that uh, we, when we think about filtering portfolio, and I think, and that way my question will be, even when we think about taxonomy, one goes in the direction of push, push, pushing finance to do the wrong thing. And if we want to have a chance to, to manage the transition, we at least have to make sure that the finance, the investors do the right thing. Uh, and so my question is, uh, how do we do this? Uh, how can we be, make sure that we are not going to get to the ultimate greenwashing, which is that we will have put a lot of weight on finance, but then we will have pushed finance to do the wrong, to go in the wrong direction, and in the end, finance will have no impact on the real economy transition. Okay, great. Many thanks. There was another question over here. I think gentleman over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moses Peleno from Bank of Botswana. I have, I have just two short questions. I think the first one was just looking at the panel and listening to you all and thinking about the standard setting process with respect to this issue. In my mind, I was wondering whether amongst you we can have a unifier. I'm worried about proliferation and fragmentation and sometimes confusion coming from multiple sources of standards to the same you know, firms and, and so forth. So I think it's something that I was just wondering what construct can we have at the global level and provide leadership around standard setting on the climate risks? I think that's just one issue. The other question I think has been partly taken by the UN person, because I think thinking about beyond just safety and soundness of financial institutions in, in, in designing any regulation and so forth, the other aspect is, particularly for developing countries, is the question of a promoting financial intermediation and reducing again fragmentation of very small markets that are required, particularly for example in issues around solar and other energy sources that could help in these issues. So is there a way in which we can construct also, I don't know whether this is feasible, regulations can that promote a financing Thank you. Okay, uh, very good, very interesting questions. Unfortunately, we have only a few minutes left for all of this. And it goes very much to this fundamental point, what should be the role of regulation, right, when dealing with us, these issues. So let me ask uh, panelists whether they'd like to intervene on any of the questions. I remind you, there was a question about the agricultural sector, exposed to both the world and the climate uh, developments. How could, I mean, what, is, what the revolution could do about, about that? There was a question about, you know, moving from pure credit risk assessment to ESG assessment. There was a question also about finance, the risk that finance can actually go to wrong projects and then basically having no possibility to finance properly the transition. And then, obviously, the very fundamental question about 
well, I mean, what, uh, what should, how to strike the right balance between, you know, development and safety and soundness when designing regulation. Very deep issues. I'm sorry that you have basically, you have one minute, minute per question, more or less. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me open a competition uh, okay. among <laughs> panelists to start. You start, no. Yeah. So, so just touching on a couple of those things there, you raised some really important points. I think, you know, I'll bring it back to me for a second, but then I'll answer your question. So we're trying to get more transparency around transition plans, and part of what we're trying to get transparency around would be the real economy transition plans, including those affecting the agricultural sector and others. And it's a really source, important source of information that can then be used in partnership with others. So I was looking at the... Um, GFAN's proposals that have been put out on transition for the real economy in the last week. And that's got some really important stuff in there because I think importantly what they're saying there is it's not enough to say banks don't fund particular types of industries, it's rather banks provide funding for new initiatives that are solving problems for climate, provide funding to organisations that have got transition plans to fund those transition plans. And I think it's looking at the use of that information in that new context which is a, an important next step, and so I think there are initiatives there um, following from COP26 that, that are in play. And on the fragmentation point, of course, I have to comment on that. Um, so I think we're meant to play a big role in reducing fragmentation by trying to get this global set of information that's high quality used around the world. And then really, I think this panel's a sign of unification, because I'm hoping that our data will be used by pretty much all of these people here, and that, and that uh, Sabine will actually help me in terms of the data that we're producing, and then that will be used sort of collectively in harmony. I think that is the dream of everybody on this panel. Right, so Not easy, but that's the vision. <laughs> Maybe I continue from me uh, very briefly. Um, let me start with um, the question with, you know, is ESG really helping us or, you know, mostly our wealth is based on carbon incentive um, industry, you know, and the whole transition will not work if we just quit the mm. carbon in, in intensive uh, industry. That's just not going to happen. So the major point, that's what I try to uh, make uh, or point out initially, is we need not only money to invest in green tech, you know, but also into the, the existing companies to mm, get transition. them to net zero, to transition. Yeah. So transition financing is much more important than green financing yeah. because the green investments, anyhow, you know, the demand is by far uh, higher than, than the supply. So I don't, you know, I'm not worried about green tech financing, but rather about, you know, financing, allowing the real economy to, 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 to do this journey. Second point on raging agencies, you know, absolutely right. Um, what we need to see is not a separate ESG labeling that's paid by a dependent uh, task, right? But rather, you know, I want to see into the credit ratings also the climate risk, right? Probably into that, because this is really what matters on the market. And um, then maybe standard setting collaboration, definitely maybe last point on, on food, on energy, on developing uh, countries. I think we really have to split uh, the tasks. I think multilateral banks play a major role in here and we really have to, you know, encourage them to do so. Maybe one point what we at the NGFS now um, working out is blended finance. What I see uh, was a lack of, and we see the first thing is public-private partnerships. So what we see is first funds where the public sector takes some of the risk of projects and to trigger private money. I think this is something where, especially in cooperation between developing countries and developed countries, we have to see progress. Thank you. Thank you. So Jonathan first and then Yeti. 30 seconds. Uh, I think on the, on the, um, to the, on the question around food security and, and, and the transition there, um, just two things that I think uh, risk sharing is key uh, around making investments more attractive and, and secondly climate adaptation and I think obviously from the IIS we are uh, looking at the role of the insurance sector in both of those uh, areas so the risk sharing um, but in some ways almost more important than the risk sharing is the role that the insurance insurers can play in promoting adaptation and, and better practices uh, to respond to, to 
to climate change. So I do think we've, we believe there's a, there is a big role there in the insurance sector to, to shepherd this transition. Um, uh, and that's, I, I mentioned briefly, our, the work we're going to be doing around protection gaps and, and natural catastrophe protection gaps, which obviously considerably impact the agricultural sector. Um, and, uh, and the role that supervisors can play in that, and some of that is, is working with governments to look at the possibility of, of public-private partnerships as well. Thanks. Many thanks. Dietrich, 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, yeah, very quickly. Um, also on, on the point raised by our FAO colleague, um, I, I think it is important to be realistic about the contribution that the financial sector can make to, to fighting climate change. And this is essentially um, pricing risks properly, allocating risks to those that can bear them, and managing risks related to climate change. So this, as we discussed, requires disclosure, data, risk management abilities. Right? I think it would be um, expecting too much to say that the financial sector alone should shoulder the burden of uh, pushing the global economy to, to net zero emissions. That, uh, for that, we will need help. We will need help uh, through real sector decisions, through sort of clear political frameworks. And um, related to that, I think um, if, if the financial sector has the capacity to price, allocate and manage climate risks, that is also the best precondition for mobilizing sustainable finance. Right? And um, I would caution against attempts to um, use um, relaxation of regulatory standards, um, um, regulatory discounts, uh, uh, green discount factors, things like that, to support sustainable finance at the detriment of financial stability, because in the end, uh, if you don't have a, a robust, stable financial system, you won't get uh, the, the financing that you need. I mean, we are seeing the problems that uh, um, monetary instability is creating right now, so um, it, running the risk for financial instability is, is not a solution. Great. Uh, it's 6.01. Uh, we are in Switzerland, so we are one minute late, actually. <laughs> Uh, so, but thank you, thank you very much. It has been a great session. I appreciate the very, very important insights have been actually shared. We have now have a very good overview of what is going on. We have a very good overview of the program of activities of different standard setting bodies represented in the table. We have been able to discuss actually issues around all that uh, important ambitious work agenda. I take it that, of course, uh, the Ukraine war, the geopolitical tensions, the macroeconomic developments, all that, of course, are quite important also for discussion of these issues, but in a way, those, are, those developments are generating any loss of esteem in the work, the attention, the energy, <laughs> nice word now, the energy that is put by standard setting bodies to develop their own agendas. With that, let me thank you all and wish you a very good, a very good day. Thank you very much.